That should be fine. Oh my God. I just have to sit like this. Um, Dan. Jack. Uh, first things first. I need I need to get your take. Okay. Your reaction to the Joe Biden. Uh, uh, what was that? <laughs> it was. <laughs> you sent me a picture and I was just like, I don't, is this a waxwork or something? <laughs> that like, was a photo. Which of these characters are waxworks and which of these are real people? Exactly. Why, why, what is Joe Biden doing in this Hobbit house? I have been having nightmares about this photo. <laughs> is the, it Jimmy Carter? It's Jimmy Carter it, and his wife. When was it taken? Is a couple it days ago, I okay. guess. Okay, I didn't yeah. know Jimmy Carter was still alive. He's still kicking. I mean, I actually don't know anything about Jimmy Carter, his presidency or... Sure. He was a Democrat, right? He was a Democrat. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I didn't know he was still alive. I mean, still good kicking. for him, I suppose. Still kicking. Yeah, yeah. hey, good for him. Why yeah. not? Um, <laughs> that Be careful, photo. Jimmy Carter. You'll end up on the list. <laughs> Let's put him on the list. Jimmy Carter, Death Watch. Not for any bad reason. Just no, no, no. it's probably going to die no, soon. No, no, no. I mean, I don't even know. <laughs> Sad. What is the purpose of this list at all? Just to just to keep tabs, just to keep tabs on people, yeah. just to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's oh, we talked about it. It's checking in. It's checking in. Yeah. How you doing? You all right? Yeah. Is everybody okay? Um, but the thing that I think freaked me out so much about that photo of Joe Biden, the doctor, Jimmy Carter, and I hate to say, it, but I actually don't know Jimmy Carter's wife's name, um, is that everything in <laughs> that <laughs> house is the size of uh, um. Jimmy Carter and his wife, and who are extremely <laughs> small, we should say, extremely, extremely small people at Have this point in their lives. Always, yeah, oh, it was, absolutely. So it <laughs> Imagine. Like, <whenever laughs> Imagine a America that small. electing a four foot president. <laughs> <laughs> what a ludicrous, ludicrous The day America elects a man like that will be the day <laughs> America's that we're short free. King. <laughs> America's short king. Um, yeah, I don't know. That freaked me out, that uh-huh. photo. Because uh-huh. Biden, he looked good, which was weird. It's like freaky. <laughs> like, my God, Jesus. Maybe it was just some kind of strange false perspective thing. I don't know. Maybe I don't Jimmy think so. Carter and his <laughs> wife were real, but Joe Biden yeah. and his wife were waxworks. Maybe it was actually <laughs> Jimmy Carter visits a waxwork ex- a <laughs> yeah. exhibition or something. Of the, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the Bidens. Here's the thing, Dan. If I was on the press team. <laughs> For some reason, the Bidens are in Jimmy Carter's house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. He's like, who are these people? Get out of here. Um, if I was on the White House press team uh-huh. and I was like in charge of what photos go out and what don't, why. Why, there's why, not a why, why? thing on the there's not a reason on the planet that would make me be like yeah let's publish that photo everybody looks great <laughs> that's not alienating and horrifying at all four entirely normal human beings <laughs> yeah that's four what normal fine. people <laughs> what fine examples of the species <laughs> yeah. oh god um i don't know that yeah wow all right um let's move on from that that was uh-huh, too freaky uh-huh, uh-huh. um the world is still spinning, I've noticed. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be quite dramatic if it stopped. It would be. It we, would be. we would be a mess on the wall. <laughs> so, I've let's always... pray that that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, Dan, <laughs> <laughs> I used to have this very cool fantasy about all of the gravity switching from uh, Earth to space and then no gravity to Earth. So on Earth, we'd be like, this is pretty cool. We're just floating around. Uh-huh. You'd probably lose some pets or something like yeah. that. But then come, say, you know, you're sitting on the uh, International Space Station and you're just falling forever. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I know. I, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But it's well, I mean, cool. the, the people on the International Space Station are falling forever. <sighs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, technically, I suppose we're, I don't, I don't quite know. I mean, I, I suppose our fall has been arrested. Okay. No, this isn't a scientific... <laughs> uh, uh, I just thought it would be cool. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. I've always been... I mean, I suppose I'm sorry for myself. I'm, I'm sorry to the audience. <laughs> sorry to the sorry, audience. I'm sorry for my, my lack of being cool. <laughs> or too cool. My willingness and my desire to let my uh, amateur interest in physics <laughs> take over. Amateur interest in physics... But your um, professional, professional interest, interest in communism. Oh. <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. I mean, that too. Yeah. <laughs> I have an entirely, uh, yeah, entirely professional commitment to communism. Yeah. 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 Well, Dan, um, mm. uh, should, uh, yeah, should we just go for it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything else to say. I was, um, I was, I don't know what, yeah, what I've been doing in my life. Mm. I've been having a strange time of it. And I mm. went. <laughs> I went to the supermarket with a with a desire to. Well, I suddenly had this overwhelming urge to be silly, <laughs> and I, I saw a guy, um, God bless him, okay, Uh-oh. Uh, wearing a Slipknot T-shirt. Oh no! <laughs> oh, no. 
that's how it's like. Yes, that's how I can be silly. I can walk around Sainsbury's and no one will know that I'm listening to Slipknot. <laughs> so I, uh, I walk around Sainsbury's and listen to Slipknot. Not because I was in a, a like Slipknot mood or mind sure, time, but sure. I was. I just wanted to feel a bit ludicrous in myself. And okay. there's, a, there's a like a sort of yeah nostalgic mocking slash affinity <laughs> with one's younger self. Sure, it's good fun. Yeah. But I like it might be a trite and a slightly cliched take. <laughs> a sort of hipster take huh. but like i think the album slipknot by slipknot okay here we go it's not too bad interesting yeah. wow yeah. all right so. i i remember yeah when i was uh in middle i mean school. not too bad not too bad like it's a new metal band sure. a new metal album <laughs> sure. from like 1999 or whatever yeah. yeah but still yeah good fun nardwar has a great interview with slipknot okay. that, that rocks uh-huh. i mean nardwar I don't know is. you don't know who nardwar is no. oh my god dan I'll, I'll send you some Nardwar interviews. Okay. He's just this freak from the Pacific Northwest who interviews people. <laughs> and it rocks. I mean, okay. Yeah. I was about to slight the Pacific Northwest. By, yeah, by all means. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is there anybody there that isn't? <laughs> hey, zing. <laughs> oh. um, I, I know. There probably are like our no till comrades. Uh, exactly. Of them. Yeah. And Except for like the fascists. Exactly. Yeah. I was about to say. And the like neo-Nazis. Yeah. Um, I, I remember when I used to work... No Till Proud Boys. <laughs> no Till Proud Boys. They're getting there. They're slowly getting there. I remember... <laughs> yeah, they'd be like half of our platform plank, like, <laughs> yeah, cement, I, cemented in their minds. Kind of. Well, I'm not going to say comrades, but no. hey, No Till's No Till. No. Don't get me started on No Till and Foxes. <laughs> um, I was going to say, when I used to work for uh, a record label, we did a bit <laughs> of metal. Foxes came to join Till. Fucking Foxes. <laughs> yeah, don't get me started. Uh, sorry. When I used to work for a record label, we did a bit of metal, and it was like, I remember when I used to tell people that, they'd be like... Metal, so like corn? <laughs> I'd be like, ah, fuck. I'd be like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Did you find over time that it was easier to say yes or no to that question? I would just be like, ah, I <laughs> yeah, I guess, sure, why not? Corn, yeah, okay, all right. Um, but yeah, so, don't get yeah. me started on foxes. I'm officially pissed off. I officially am. I can't believe I've ever been on a pro fox kick. They came and they've been digging up my beds every single night. I had to put in some anti fox. Uh, uh, Structures, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> to make sure they'd stop. You've built yeah. a barricade. Yeah, yeah. Sentry turrets, that kind of Traps. thing. Traps. Traps, yeah. If you see a pile of leaves, don't step on it because it's really a pit <laughs> of spikes. <laughs> um, uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. Fox has been digging up my onions. Not a, not a fan. One of them, did I, did I send you the photo? One of them dug up where my best garlic was and then in the hole took a shit. <laughs> I was just like, what the hell? Was just like, some Jesus. troll foxes. Like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. And they haven't been eating anything. That's the weird thing. I think they just like, they're attracted to the no-till beds because it smells like manure or something. Mm. They just go and mess with them and then mm. leave. It's like, at least eat something. Mm-hmm. So it's frustrating. All the onions, I've rebuilt the beds and they're all mm. fine, I think. But it's like, geez, guys. Yeah. Yeah, if dogs like fox poo, <laughs> fox is like Cow horse poo. poo? <laughs> horse poo, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Mm. It's the circle of, I don't know, anyway. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Anyway, I'm siding with the Tories on this one. I hate to say it. Speaking of Tories, Dan, uh-huh. um, and speaking of people who possibly don't like Tories, should we introduce the reader as to what we, not the reader, the listener, as to what we read this week? <laughs> I'm not actually sure what it was, so you might, have, right. to, you might have to do yeah, that. Yeah, by all means. Yeah. We read, dear listener. It was great, folks. It was good. It was yeah, good. yeah, yeah. I, so a while ago, I picked up this book, not really knowing who this fellow was. We read Philip S. Fawner's a couple chapters from his first volume of the history of the American labor movement or the history of the labor movement in the United States. We read the first few chapters um, in which he chronicles the kind of like move from settler colonial state, at least on the East coast to more of like a settled state, but mainly like the role of labor in the early United States going from colony to where we read up to, to the revolutionary war. Um, and Foner's interesting. I mean, I don't know if I would classify him as a Marxist. I don't know if he would have himself, mainly because he got, like, I think, kind of red scared um, out of his uh, tenure or whatever. I think that he kind of was writing in that time period. So this is a little outdated at points, but I think that his writing style and his thoroughness and his historical approach to this time period... Um, uh, does wonders to elucidate, I will say. Mm, um, mm. And yeah, I really, I really, really like this book. And it is, these first few chapters specifically are a really good look at American history in a way that is not taught in uh, American schools. 
I should say. Yeah, there are pieces of language in this that made me think that he clearly um, had some sort of Marxist framing basis sure. for the way he was thinking. Mm. I mean, he clearly interprets the world and this piece of history, I suppose, in terms of the sort of transition between modes of production or has the mode of production in mind. Mm. And I mean, he's, he's clearly writing a history not only of the labor movement, but of how um, the actions of uh, representatives of the labor movement or of American labor related to the sort of material conditions under which they were living kind of thing. It's clearly a very materialist analysis of sure. this history, I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I find it very compelling. I mean, we'll get on to like mm. uh, sort of what his broad thesis is, I suppose, mm. and whether we have enough knowledge to say whether we agree <laughs> with it or not. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think after last week, we were definitely interested in <laughs> reading a bit more about American labor history, and we kind of went a little too far <laughs> yeah, back in yeah, time. We, we, last, last week, we, uh, last week, we de de <laughs> uh, declared, portrayed our ignorance about the the... 20th century labor movement in the U.S. <laughs> so we went to the and 17th we went to the century. beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I like I said, I really, really like this book. And to start us off, Dan, I think I'm going to do something that I haven't done in a while. Let's just uh, read us the first paragraph. So he says, our good friend Philip Foner says, Captain John Smith once wrote of colonial America, nothing is to be expected thence but thy labor. This was by way of advice to English merchant capitalists who look forward to America as a source of great profits. They soon learned that Captain Smith was right, that in Virginia, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, were no fabulous cities ripe for looting like those visited by Marco Polo. Whatever wealth there was in the New World would have to come from the hard labor of mining, cutting down forests, planting and harvesting crops, and constructing buildings, roads, and bridges. America would bring great profits, the Virginia Company wrote, in the winter of 1616 to 1617 in a broadside to prospective investors as soon as there were, quote, more hands in the new world to exploit its resources, end quote. So, I mean, that definitely frames this entire book, obviously, because he's kind of writing, as he says in the title, about the history of the labor movement in the United States. But it's funny because, like, in American schools, you are taught the, like, and these heroes came over to the United States in the face of great dangers. And, you know, there are people looking for adventure and religious freedom. And the pure persecution. In exactly. The yeah. At the hands of the dastardly syphilitic British. Um, and he... Catholics. He, Catholics. <laughs> exactly. Whoa, whoa. Um, he makes the point right away that uh, these new hands that Captain uh, John Smith wrote about uh, perhaps did not come not only willingly they came unwillingly in many cases obviously in terms in terms of slavery but also in terms of indentured servitude uh -huh. but um they were duped uh, they were duped cases. absolutely but also america was not really founded by heroes it was founded by people who were just like damn we can make some money out there baby <laughs> <laughs> which yeah 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 not what you're how, how, how do you feel about not only not <laughs> oh, only God. um can your uh, <laughs> Australian forebears beat uh, hard by the prospect yeah. of not having been the most savory characters. Oh but my now. god! <laughs> For this episode, I almost I almost dug up the uh, um, someone in my family found the like court document of one of my ancestors who was like the reason that he was sent to uh, his like trial for before he got sent to England or to Australia. And it's very funny. He was just like was, apparently he got sent over for larceny. I'm not sure what he exactly took, but it was like his defense is really funny because he just says something like, I had had a pint of rum. I knew not what I had done. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, damn, all right. <laughs> Good for you. I try that one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I had a pint of rum. <laughs> mm. I wonder if that meant something different back then because uh -huh. Jesus... <laughs> Yeah, so suffice it to say, a good portion of the, the mm. early colonists in America were also people sentenced there for uh, yeah, um, humble and forgivable crimes. Humble and forgivable crimes. Or just not even crimes, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, he talks about these people, these capitalists, going into poor cities, 
not just in um, England, but in Ireland, obviously, as well, but in, in Germany. Oh, Basically, yeah, any poor neighborhood they would go to and just distribute propaganda and leaflets basically being like, sign up here, don't worry about what you're signing, and you can come to America where you'll have a better life and get paid much more and, you know, live this life where it's being built by your own hands. Um, and that duped a lot of people into basically just out of necessity, um, signing up to come to this extremely hostile continent yeah. under hostile labor conditions. I mean, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the one just slight tangent from that, well, mm. the one thing that occurs to me first is the relationship between this narrative and, um, again, referring back to episode three and four, <laughs> when we talked about Ellen Meeks' with The Origins of Capitalism, wow. and when she was talking about um, the sort of logic of improvement and how that influence the colonizing of the americas mm. um and early um sort of capitalist uh the, the sort of capitalist or the distinctly english or distinctly capitalist form of colonialism to be distinguished from sort of like uh spanish or portuguese colonialism yeah which was the kind of like looting and uh, yeah. that we we heard described in that first passage kind of thing um which makes sense would like relate to the the very the different modes of production operating in both of those in those mm. countries I suppose um, this is a slightly different take as it was sort of about opportunity right you sort of sort of makes you wonder what would they have done if they had actually gone to America and found that there were there were settled yeah uh, populations with vastities of sort of gold and yeah. great fortunes and stuff. Um, well, yeah, Foner makes the point about them trying to enslave the Indians because yeah. they were like, oh, we, we made, we did our yeah. best job. He's like, the Indians had the propensity to want to <laughs> escape and yeah. then come, come back with all their friends. Come back and, and kick our asses. <laughs> yeah. um, so that didn't work out. Not a out. good idea. Yeah, they very rapidly gave up on the idea of enslaving the Indians. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Which also very quickly uh, became just wipe them out, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, you're, you are right in the sense that... Um, the beginning of this narrative or this the, the first chapter is more about conditions in Europe than they are conditions in America. Yeah. Um, and the, which were by all accounts pretty dreadful. Yeah. Jeez. Um, and how America was sold to a great many people as a sort of land of milk and honey kind of yeah. thing where wages were so much higher um, and people could live a much more, a much higher life, much more, um, uh, Live a better standard of life, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and how, in the vast majority of cases, that was a lie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, um, and and as you say, people were obviously the 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 crossing was incredibly expensive, and so most people signed up to commit themselves to a certain number of years of labor in America for to have the the price of their crossing covered. And quite often what they got in America was not what they were banking on kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Either it was um, much longer hours and a much harsher uh, and more disciplined environments, but also a lot of people were either went as skilled laborers or in the case of like um, uh, young people and children were sold on the promise that they would be taught some kind of trade, which then mm. their new effective owners for the duration of their their debt to these people sort of failed to provide them in a lot of cases and instead sort of like had them function as yeah like i don't know slaves slaves <laughs> effective much, slaves yeah. Yeah, that's what i wanted to say yeah, yeah, yeah. well i mean it also sort of like, i was sort of pausing on it but um <laughs> yeah but that but, but there are significant parallels to be made between uh the slave population of america and the indentured uh laborer Slavery. population of america mm -hmm. um a lot of which is revealed in the alliances that were formed between the two groups, the sort mm. of political alliances, but also and, and the like that were formed between the two groups mm. in this early history of sort of American political formation, but also sort of like sort of action of rebellion and self defense. And yeah, and like. absolutely. And I mean, just just to go back really quick to what you said about like children, I think he said at one point, I forget exactly what the names of these people were, but specifically in Ireland. These capitalists would just hire people to just go oh, yeah, and just they steal were just kids. Like ch yeah, ch child catcher. Yeah, yeah, there was a phrase for them, wasn't there? What was it, was it like called? Like grabbers or something? Or something? No, <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was very... Um, grabbers. I thought it was very... Um, 
It's in here somewhere. I don't know. But the that was literary. horrifying. Yeah. That's just like you're just some kid walking down the street minding your own business in merry old Ireland. And then you just get taken, put on a ship. And then like – let me let me just read another bit really quick just to describe this uh, – this, this crossing for these people for the for the white indentured laborers um in june 16 in june 1767 the editor of the south carolina gazette asked citizens of charleston to aid 300 irish indentured servants who had just arrived he had visited their lodgings and found in each room quote two and three score at a time many dying and some derived of their sense young children lying entirely naked whose parents had expired a few weeks ago um and then he goes on to basically outline about how these, this like human cargo would basically just be advertised in the newspapers alongside soap and butter and potatoes coming from Ireland as like, hey, if anybody wants to buy these people's contracts, quote unquote, just basically like their indentured servitude, you can come to me. Some of them might be dying and also their kids are also probably dying sitting in the hull of my ship. So just take them, please. I'll give you their contracts. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. boy, that's... Um, how my country was founded? Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not great to say nothing of slavery. It's uh -huh. like, oh my God. Um, but to say something of slavery. Yes. We, sh we should definitely we move on to that. <laughs> yeah. Let me just hit you with some numbers that Philip Fawner tosses out, which are pretty stunning. He says that by 1770, there were about 250,000 immigrants to the United States and over 100,000 of them were prisoners or they were kidnapped, right? That's to basically say nothing of the slavery going on in the South, but which he says... In five of the southern colonies by 1770, slaves equaled or outnumbered the settlers. Um, so when we talk about, you know, when John Smith talks about there's money to be made here, you just need labor. You really see how the capitalists bought the labor over. It was through force and through kidnapping and through uh, smarmy contracts with uh, the white laborers, if they even bothered to give them contracts for indentured servitude, and with the black laborers just kidnapping them and stealing them. And in many cases, obviously, you don't need to go into the history of slavery, but like slaughtering sure. them yeah, yeah, yeah. to get them on the yeah. boats. Yeah. 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 Basically, like the slave population of America was vast at this point, but also considerably vaster if you included all of these indentured servants, which mm -hmm. were who were basically living under um, slave conditions who did eventually get out of their contracts, but they they worked and lived under horrendous circumstances we've just heard. And then um, quite a lot of the punishments for them having escaped were fines. And then I was sort of also additional time added to their uh, terms of service kind of thing. So um, sort of became this impossible trap to get out of in some respects. Yeah. Um, yeah. And some, I mean, some of these terms of service were seven years seemed to be the kind of the longest one kind of mm -hmm. thing. But um mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but then it's just the typical thing of like, okay, my seven years are up. What am I going to do, do now? now? Yeah, Probably yeah, go yeah, back yeah. to doing the exact same thing yeah. for a pitiful wage, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And I mean, it's funny too, because Foner talks about, again, this goes against the typical like American grade school narrative of like why slavery wasn't in the North. And obviously it wasn't just because people in the North, they're so much more refined than people mm. in the South and they're so much better. He basically just says that it, Adam Smith, I think he quotes is saying that, um, a wage laborer was cheaper than a slave in the North, just due to the nature of the industry. It was yeah. cheaper to have someone that you just pay, a, you know, an hourly, daily wage, whatever, than to have someone who is technically your property, which yeah. is vile. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he talks about the seasonal nature of a lot of the work, doesn't he? Mm. And he's sort of suggesting that the the farm work done by slaves in the South was all year round kind of thing. So it was profitable or worthwhile um, owning slaves and keeping them all year round and covering those costs i mean minimal as i'm sure they or sure. as minimal that they they made their efforts to make the costs as minimal as possible kind of thing yeah. but whereas in the north where a lot of lot more of the work that was done was seasonal for one reason or another which i haven't quite worked out whether it was yeah. a different type of agriculture that was done or because of the the nature of the latitude or maybe it was a lot of it was um i mean i suppose a lot of trades just probably slowed down in the winter months across the board kind of thing sure. but maybe also a lot of it was like uh in ports a lot of people worked in port cities in the kind of thing so mm. maybe trade sort of costs cross atlantic trade probably um sort of ebbed in the winter and sort of thrived in the summer i yeah, suppose as true. well um so yeah the main reason why slavery was not so prevalent in the north was basically that nobody wanted to have a workforce all mm. year round kind of thing mm. rather people um went either went from job to it was much easier people sort of moved from job to job kind of thing or spent periods of the time unemployed and periods of the time employed mm -hmm. um 
which is one of the things that's sort of then complemented and added to the sense of or the degree of um, impoverishment of these uh, laboring mm-hmm. uh, f- ostensibly f- the free labor free laborers of north america kind of thing was that, yeah um unemployment came regularly and it struck very hard yeah um and it led to great poverty as well amongst the sort of like urban uh, laboring classes yeah absolutely and i mean yeah, i think you're definitely right up right to bring up the seaports um because that's kind of where the wage laborer as you said first kind of showed up in large numbers right yeah. um and it was because of the like i kind of i so I suppose a lot of it, like the carpentry and that kind of thing, um, was done by itinerant workers. And he makes the point about how you needed to be an itinerant worker to move one, from one place to the other if you wanted to make a living as like someone who was paid a wage and be like specialized in something. You couldn't just stay in one town. Yeah. But also just because of the nature of the work as well in the seaports, um, there needed to be, as he says, mechanics, which Dan and I haven't really... He uses that phrase throughout this entire book. And yeah, I, yeah, like yeah. it just... It seems by the, t- it by the yet. time of the revolution, like everybody is either like a member of the landed gentry or a mechanic. <laughs> or a mechanic, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Or Which... plausibly like a farmer, but he's like mm. quite keen to reduce the impact of farming. Yeah. Or the ac- the action, or the conscious action of farmers as revolutionary agents, mm. um, because it would seem that they're often considered to be like the the prime, the er. Uh, uh, yeah. revolutionary in america <laughs> yeah. anyway i'm getting beyond beyond <laughs> yeah well it's interesting he brings up at a point later in this book about how um when america really tried to industrialize how because of the nature of this work of um kind of like the number of agriculture workers and stuff like that because people were so self-sufficient it was really hard at first to industrialize uh-huh. this is post the revolution in the yeah. in the in the 19th century yeah yes yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and the latter half of the 18th century it was very much just like there's a quote in here that's something along the lines of like, I would rather wear a homespun shirt than like um, yeah. uh, submit to like a low wage, some kind of like early uh, wage laborer in one of these seaport towns who was, you know, having like a very early version of a union to try and raise wages by getting everybody yeah. to agree. Yeah. Basically made the point about, you know, obviously, like I said, he would rather wear a homespun shirt, which is to say that makes the point that like so much of the production at this time in America was done in like what we might now call, I don't know, small holdings or something sure. like that. It was just done at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he says quite a lot of interesting things about the development of the working class. Oh, it's a book about the American working class. <laughs> he would say a lot of interesting things about the American working class, but a lot of things which contribute to what you might consider like a class analysis of this time kind of mm. thing. So in this earlier period that we're considering, like the 1650s, 1640s onwards, um, or through the 17th century into the 18th century, there's this sense in which you have um the colonial landowners or the merchants or what have you and then they're sort of like using all of this indentured or slave labor um as the the main workforce to sort of extract the wealth of the americas and then to mm. transport it back to mother england i suppose or <laughs> the mother Britain. the metropole no, no, no. quite <laughs> the the metropole that is syphilitic <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, but he does suggest that as we get into the, God, I get my centuries and my, my, the, the 1700s, let's say, sure, okay. that's the 18th century, yeah. right? As we get into the 18th century, <laughs> there is this transition that happens whereby a great, a, a, a larger and larger bulk of the American working populace is, as you say, tradespeople, mm. um, in various pr- professions. And it's quite significant because, um, as we get toward the, the, the the revolution and then the the war of independence um quite a lot there is quite a lot of significance placed on these various associations of these workers mm. they're not really trade unions kind of thing to yeah. some extent they're guilds to some extent mm-hmm. they're they function as voting be- blocks and bases kind of thing um but they function as significant populations kind of thing um but yeah as i was saying the um or as sort of you were alluding to um the populace was either largely like small they were either sort of craftspersons so mm-hmm. what you i suppose you'd call like i mean it would be it would be misleading to call them petty bourgeois i suppose <laughs> but like um artisans would yeah. probably be the, the the sort of correct piece of terminology i suppose or they were 
um, farmers who were engaged in something something cl- more akin to a feudal mode of production in that as you say they were there was a lot of like um, either they were meeting all of their needs by the production that they did or that or people in the household were working in various ways um, in various trades and creating i think they were creating goods for sale i suppose but in this sort of like I forget what the correct piece of terminology is, but the, mm. the sort of like a small way, in a small way, <laughs> in, a small way. <laughs> in the in the sort of like uh, in the production in the household, kind yeah. Of um, and it takes a long time for something akin to a capitalist class that bases itself on industrial production or small scale production to develop. And he suggests that you do gradually get this development toward a sort of like a unit of economic activity, which is a sort of like master craftsmen and several journeymen yeah. and some, a certain number of apprentices working together. Um, but even then there is quite a st- close association between the members of those, that those workplaces because they're um, small units and they share quite similar interests kind of thing. It's even then it's not like you've got um, a sort of, capitalist versus his yeah. employees kind of thing they're all working together quite often and so they sort of share a certain collection of material interests so what we're looking at is much, something much closer to like a uh the sort of guild system i suppose mm. um what would be that you would have seen across europe in the preceding centuries to this mm. um so yeah not so that it, it would then it would then stand to reason that um America wasn't on the brink of, or oh, didn't easily develop this uh, large working class with a small number of sort of capitalist employers kind of thing in sure. in the in even moderately sized industrial production. Yeah, um, it was still sort of like small scale production, lots of artisanal labor kind of thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. I was just trying to think of though if there's anything interesting said about. Um, wage labor as opposed to other types of labor mm. um or there was some interesting stuff said about how people were remunerated for their labor the 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 colonial authorities started to enforce this rule that people had to be paid in the currency rather than in mm. kind i suppose or yeah. in in goods or um sort of payments had to be made in currencies which is quite co- I, but I think it's quite a common tactic for governments to get their or authorities to get their currency circulating rather than have other types of uh exchange taking place mm. kind of thing well he makes I can't the point quite that remember what that, the purpose of that was with that paper currency it was very much like a class struggle to kind of get it into place because all of the laborers wanted a paper currency that actually was worth something so oh, they said right, okay. we need to have like a land bank that makes it so that we can actually like get paid like this okay and then w- that wound up getting passed by the governing bodies or whatever at least in one specific colony i'm not entirely sure which one but then the local like aristocracy took that back to Parliament in England and they struck it down and said, no, get rid of this oh, bank. So, so I misunderstood know. that chapter. So it was the, the idea of the land bank was so that in, uh, wage laborers could be guaranteed a more secure income and yeah. the people paying the wages were much keener to fold them off or pay them so, yeah. in a different manner, which was actually less costly to them kind of thing or yeah. required them. I mean, I suppose it would make sense if you, if you're the, if you're the, you're the employer or the owner of some great swath of land or a, a, a fleet of ships if you're a sort of kind of some kind of mercantile <laughs> uh owner of some kind of mercantile empire i suppose um you would want to keep like money circulation a preserve of mm. your activity and sort of to be able to maintain your workforce in some other way i can imagine there might mm. be a rationale for having those two worlds stay apart kind of thing well it also just seems like it, things were progressing in such a way that capitalism was definitely uh uh, getting ready to go in England at around this time, and yeah. indeed, like going, yeah, and yeah. so this was a way to well, I think, uh, exploit I think, like, labor reason, much more. The reason why there was there was so much poverty in America was be- in 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 Europe rather, mm-hmm. and what was um, encouraging people to take this drastic action of move going to America, kind of thing, was it was the onset of capitalism was exactly. causing a great yeah. deal of this poverty, kind of thing. Yeah, it was a sort of like new. He talks quite a lot about the. Um, People use it, losing their an, that sort of ancestral or feudal rights to certain um, means of subsisting, and the growth of vagrancy and the punishment for vagrancy, sure. and the sort of drift of people into the cities, and this great sort of like 
uh, city populations that were then living in squalid conditions. And, sure. But you know. yeah, but there's also this other side of the coin, which was America is kind of like a way to depress labor practices in a way that was like, oh, wait, if we just have indentured servants, that's actually kind of just much better for us because we don't necessarily like have to pay these people like a wage. Like wage labor was definitely like, I mean, if I was, you know, some aristocratic schlub, I would probably rather not pay somebody like paper money. I'd rather just have that be reserved for something else and me just be like, either pay them in kind, as you're saying, or just like have indentured servants. Yeah. So it, it was kind of like almost like a step back in time for some of the colonies where you're able to like, you know, obviously like, you know, you need to be able to like, labor practice is kind of like developed in a way in England where it was like, okay, now we actually have to pay people like because wage labor uh, has become a thing. Going to America in some of these colonies meant either just straight up using slavery yeah. or, you know, in some of the Northern colonies where things developed that wage labor began to become a thing. It was like, all right, well, we would rather not have that. We'd rather be yeah, able to yeah, do yeah. what we've keep, yeah. been doing forever. Yeah, I do. I do kind of wonder whether where the figure that came from for the cost of a crossing to America, mm. what that actually represented, kind yeah, of thing, yeah, know, and whether yeah. these people that were actually ostensibly paying for people to come to America, whether they were actually paying that cost at all. Yeah, well, they certainly weren't feeding them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know where that money was going. There wasn't a lot of bunk space on these boats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No kidding, Jesus. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It was. It is kind of worth talking too, just a little bit more about England at that time. Um, just to j just to read a little bit more of what Fawner says, he says, "A plentiful land, meaning America, so too was England, but not for the common people. Feudalism was on the deathbed in England, and although now and then it gave a spasmodic evidence of vigor, it had pretty thoroughly been replaced by a capitalist economy. As the new economy advanced, it bought both important progressive changes and increased misery. The rapid rise of the woolen industry, for example, caused more and more land to be devoted to sheep raising rather than to grain growing. The land was now enclosed, tenants were driven off to make room for sheep, <laughs> and a few herders took the place of many farm laborers. The number of paupers who had neither land nor work increased rapidly, and their plight was aggravated by the dissolution of the monasteries, which deprived the poor of charitable aid. And then he also goes on to say that while prices soared, um, wage wages remained exactly the same. And we were talking a bit before this about how kind of funny it is that there was like a maximum on wages. Yes, and it's like, yeah. if you're caught paying someone more than what you're supposed to, you're going to prison. The punishment, the, yeah, the punishment. <laughs> well, actually, the, some of the punishments are like 10 days for the employer and 20 days for the employee. But then like they would sort of ramp up through more instances of it happening kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and there were instances of that happening in America. I think in the, in the 18th century... So later on in this period, when we're talking about what's happening in England, similar practices were employed. And then there was one little bit where uh, an employer is moralizing about uh, what it would mean if he paid his employees more and <laughs> what sort of deporch debauched acts they would sort of like uh, spend this uh, money facilitating. I like imagining that, I mean, I don't have to imagine that's still what people say. Yeah. Like, don't pay, <laughs> yeah, don't can't pay, pay McDonald's workers $15. <laughs> My God, what would they get up to? Drug addicts. Um, yeah, not great, folks. Not great. I love there was one little aside about how, like, the aristocracy in America knew that something was amiss when one of the local, like, barons or whatever, like, attempted to take his horse into town and he couldn't get uh, the, like, rabble on the road to move their cart. Because he was like, oh, pardon me, I'm the local lord, would you mind moving your cart? <laughs> and the guys were like, ah, you know, they had this grand, like, I am just as good as you. I'm a man just like you. And they refused to move his cart, so he went into town and had them arrested. <laughs> That's awesome. Bring that back. I think that's pretty cool. All I'm saying, get off the road for your local lord. It's your duty. Doff your cap. <laughs> Doff your goddamn cap, people. Um, also, just to make another point about these syphilitic northerners um, in America, um, one of the other reasons that slavery was never... Uh, well, not was never, but uh, was practiced much less in the North than in the South was because they were very frightened about the prospect of slave <laughs> rebellions. Rightfully so, uh -huh. obviously, because of the number of semi-successful slave rebellions in the South. But in the North, they're just like, eh, it's too much for us. We're not going to deal with this. Mm -hmm. We're just going to slowly do away with the whole process. Um, it's the morals of the North, mm -hmm. as we're as we're And correct me if I'm wrong, but there were some quite significant rebellions of Absolutely. indentured workers as well i mean mm, obviously yeah. there were significant slave rebellions but there were also quite a lot of rebellions of indentured uh, laborers mm. and also he makes a big point of focusing on instances in which um slaves and indentured white workers would find common cause 
mm. and escape together. Quite he reported yeah. quite a lot of like newspaper reports of um, slaves and indentured laborers like escaping together or allying together in rebellion and the like. Like there was um, quite a lot of recognition between these two groups of their common plight. Mm. I suppose. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. I su- I suppose we should talk about the paragon of uh, American history and of really virtue uh-huh. in general, historical virtue, the paragon of virtue, which is the Revolutionary War. Um, <laughs> what do you call it out here? Do you call it the War of Independence, the American War of Independence? I. Ooh. I was quite struck. At, well, I, I used. I, I. I don't. I don't know whether it was before the mics were hot or <laughs> while we were recording. I, I. I deliberately drew a distinction between the revolution and the war of independence. Interesting. Okay. I don't know whether that's actually. It's something that's Fauna seems to draw out. Well, oh. I mean, he uses some t- pieces of terminology that kind of hinted at that, and I was just mimicking him. <laughs> I think I would probably talk about the American Revolution. Sure. Um, as a sort of discrete act. I don't know whether I don't know whether I was ever taught some way to reflect on the War of Independence. Well, mm. maybe it's the maybe it would be the. I think I just talk about the Revolution, although sure. I wasn't really taught that period. So. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah you're, let's gloss over this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, you had a king who was mad, uh, presumably because of syphilis. <laughs> Do the Indians still like us? Yes, well, then. <laughs> exactly. Then we're fine. Um, I will say, Dan, it is very <laughs> mad, <king. laughs> mad. Mad. That's what we call him. We call him Mad King George. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Literally in American history books, like textbooks, we call him Mad King George. <laughs> I mean, the tyrant. I don't know. Probably it's called George III, I'd imagine. <laughs> it's just another king. There's, um, an a, there's, an, there's an ABC show. I think it's ABC or something. There's an American TV show about the... Um, the, the some of the sp- They're actually referenced in there, some of the spy rings. Oh, yeah. Um, uh-huh. That's my only vantage point on these things. Sure. It's yeah. an ABC show. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> what happened back then? We don't get that about it in school. It's got Billy Elliot in it. I think it's Billy Elliot. Billy Elliot? Uh, is that a person? I thought the, was a movie. Billy Elliot was a character. <laughs> oh, okay. the, the guy that played him in the TV show, I think, is the guy that plays the main spy so Macaulay Culkin? in this TV show. Like, they might way well off the Let's call it. Yeah, no, why no, not? No. Why not? Hey, we're I talking pop be, culture. I might be wrong. I might <laughs> yeah. be wrong. Yeah. Who knows? This might not even be a show. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's really easy, I will say. I think to fall into the trap, um, if you're a proud leftist, Dan, uh, to look at the American Revolution and say, <laughs> "I'm a very guilty leftist." I, mean, <laughs> yeah, I bear a lot of shame. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why I'm a Maoist. Um, <laughs> um, no, to look at the American Revolution and say that there was no social aspect to it at all, yeah. and to say that this was just a complete bourgeois revolution and that it was just capitalists being capitalists and no yeah, more goddamn United stand-backs. American populace rallied yeah. together and saw off the syphilitic Britons. <laughs> exactly. One, one mad syphilitic Brit, anyway. Exactly. Well, I mean... And his many lackeys. And his many, presumably also syphilitic lackeys. <laughs> um, why not? But... It's interesting because Fawner phrases this at first, and I thought he was going to kind of fall when I first read this into the camp of like little too patriotic and like this was the people's war. This was like yeah, God you damn do it. you do kind of worry that yeah. I mean he he casts it as he casts the 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 working class for want of a better phrase as being not only um, the the main agents in the revolutionary process, but also like. Um, the people either initiating these activities or um, representing their most extreme instantiations kind of mm. thing. The, the real vanguard of this revolution, I suppose. Mm. Um, and he's, I think this is what you're getting at. He seems to be casting the American Revolution as something that's going to meet all of their demands. And it, it almost yeah. seems like he's veering in the direction of being, what a triumph the American Revolution was, the vindication of the American working class, or like the it's laboring like classes of over his shoulder time. looking yeah. at what he's writing. <laughs> Um, Everything was fixed by the American Revolution. Yeah, exactly. And labor history, there's no more. Yeah. We figured it out. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a big book, and it's only one volume. It goes up to 1880, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, it's just him writing, and nothing happened. And nothing, nothing happened. happened. <laughs> it's all fine. The AFL is fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, you worry that he's falling into this trap of like, and the sons and daughters of liberty saw us through. But yeah. it's interesting because he he frames the early bit of the revolution as like. Certainly driven, at least parts of it, by labor, or at least by kind of class um, uh, 
what am I? What's the word? I'm Antagonism, conflict. No, the opposite. Oh, uh, class uh, alliances. Kind okay. Of, for a, for a certain point, because he talks about the agricultural workers, he talks about the wage laborers, and then he talks a bit about um, the kind of like merchant capitalists. But then he goes on to fra- frame it as like obviously what winds up happening is the like more powerful group, the group with more sway, which is the merchant capitalists and like the people with just a, or maybe not just merchant capitalists, but just the capitalists with a ton of money are able to influence the revolution and to use these people to fight for them and to then kind of wind up with the America that we know, right? And so he kind of is able to draw himself out of the trap of being like, this was the great revolutionary war where we fixed everything and frame it a lot more as like, it was almost intended to be like that, at least by the wage laborers in Boston, the like drunk uh, Samuel Adamses. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, and such, but obviously did not wind up being that. Yeah, and it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting it's, framing. Yeah, what, and what's really central to this framing is that um, it's from this preceding one hundred years or so. It's from the the various class conflicts, the class alliances, mm. uh, the common cause that people make with their co workers, the the uh, workplace alliances and guilds the various organizations, the various rebellions. It's out of the social context of America at the time, a social context which is very clearly predicated on um, its degree of economic development and the nature of its sort of mode of production, Yeah, I might as well say, mm-hmm. um, that you get a particular... T- there, there, there is a particular collection of class actors who are educated or um, or fashioned by this period of history which directly influences their connection to the revolutionary process that takes place sure um and so there is this kind of like material basis for these uh, the, the, these class actors and their activities kind of thing mm. um he makes very clear that very early on all of these working class uh, groups and associations and alliances um i mean they fashion themselves both into um, unions or guilds or what have you representatives of specific trades but also as you say like groups like the Sons of Liberty who mm-hmm. were entirely working class and mostly like city dwelling working class Yeah. Um, he makes the point that the it's, the ver- it's a very avowed um, position that these people hold that there are sort of two um so focuses for their anger, I suppose. Mm. There is the colonial British, and then there is the local, the 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 American oppressor, I suppose, mm. the, uh, the the aristocracy of America. Um, and so, therefore, and that this is this is quite clear and quite apparent, and it leads to this degree of ambivalence among um, the American ruling class who ha- have certain antagonisms with the British, but also. Use them to Can't, bail themselves. Are very out. reluctant to make common cause with these people who are as much baying for their blood as they are for the British. Kind yeah. Of thing. Um, and so there is this. There's this sense in which the the working class is driving on the most radical elements of this revolutionary process, mm. um, and the sort of the Tories, the conservative, the the these Tories the, again. The, the ruling class elements are clearly playing second, second fiddle to this activity yeah. and as quite a, 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 a continue to be quite keen to um reassure the british i suppose or to like um they're, they're incredibly reluctant to commit to declaring independence yeah one of the interesting things he makes a point of uh, is saying that there's this this guild of um mechanics <laughs> um and it's from within this guild that the idea is first propagated that they ought f- form a, a constitutional congress or a, con- a continental congress mm. is the phrase, isn't it? Mm. Um, which obviously would come on to be very significant. Sure. But it was out of these working class groups that this idea came. It wasn't from yeah. the sort of rich and privileged classes. Yeah. These sort of like pivotal American institutions or revolutionary institutions uh, came into existence kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The number of times that parliament had to bail uh, the American ruling class out of like hot spots that they were put into by a class struggle was like, it happened quite a bit. And Fonder makes the point explicitly where he's like, you know, more than any stamp act or, or tea act or sugar act or anything like that. Like these people were afraid of class struggle and they were afraid of what these people could do. You know, these uh, uh, hokey uh, commoners 
um, if they were not left in check. Um, and so I'll read another quote, Dan. I promise it's my last one. But he says, uh, Fawner says, It is clear then that had the mechanics and laborers had their way, the break with England would have come much sooner. But after 1770, wealthy planters, lawyers, and merchants assumed leadership of the revolutionary movement and gradually relegated the mechanics to a subordinate place. It was inevitable, of course, that this should happen. In a country predominantly agricultural, the mechanics, artisans, and day laborers were far less numerous than the farmers and less influential than the merchants and planners. In the earlier phases of the revolutionary movement, the urban lower classes were able to exert tremendous influence because it was easier to organize in the cities than in the country districts, where roads were wretched and communication difficult. Throughout the remainder of the revolutionary struggle, the mechanics and laborers were able to prod the more conservative elements, but they were not yet strong enough to lead the revolutionary movement for any length of time. Nevertheless, the services rendered by the revolutionary ancestors of the working class cannot be underestimated. They served, quote, I'm not sure who he's quoting here, but as the spearhead of the movement to free the colonies from England and to establish greater democracy in America, they made up the bulk and formed the backbone of the great street demonstrations of the day, and in addition, furnished the forces necessary to circulate petitions, distribute handbills, fight British troops, and dump tea into the harbors. Had it not been for them, the revolution would have been stillborn. Um, so yeah, that's a really great way of looking at it, about how the revolution was uh, perhaps inevitable, but really something that the ruling classes, Fonder is making the point at least, um, something that the ruling classes dragged their feet towards. Because again, uh, they would rather have a sugar act or two than the rabble running things. But again, then they were able to, you know, go with the flow a little bit and not break completely in the wind. And those that sided with the revolution were able to be just fine coming out the other end. Like George Washington. <laughs> mm. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Wait a minute. <laughs> John Adams. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh my God. Donald Trump. <laughs> um, one thing, Dan, that is, and I'm going to ask you about the British education system at the end of the episode, but one thing that the American education system really talks about a lot, whenever you talk about the Revolutionary War, you have to talk about Valley Forge. Now, I don't know if you know much about Valley Forge, but Valley Forge was like the great well, horrible, like, it pretty winter. It's, yeah, it was awful. Yeah. A lot of people died. Yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. this winter where a bunch of, you know, the American army under George Washington just had to, like, sit in a field and freeze to death, and they didn't have any food, and they didn't have any or boots. Shoes, but, apparently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They had nothing, but they were, you know, gosh darn it, these were the tough Americans, and they toughed through it, and then went mm. kicked the British ass after mm. that winter. And Fawner's like, the only reason that that happened was because of the greed of the people who were uh, supplying the contracts for the uh, shoes and for the food and for everything. And so it was this same uh, ruling class group that dragged its feet. Uh, and you know what, Dan? Forced our proud boys in blue to suffer out there in Valley Forge. <laughs> Again, just another uh, bit of American history that Fawner kind of has to uh, <laughs> not ruin, but make much more realistic. <laughs> I mean, he does a, he does a, um, yeah, so we've gotten to the point where, like, the the working class with their, I mean, pre-existing to the revolution sort of demands for greater representation, both sort of political, but also in their own organizations, um, had constantly had to force themselves onto the stage, um, constantly had to, like, take the hand of the more conservative elements in this movement and sort of, like, it was the working class that were, um, sort of seized weapons left, right, and center, formed militias whenever necessary, would sort of like um, take the swiftest action to sort of like react to movements of the British kind of thing. And then, as you've said, like as this revolutionary process took off, um, more um, sort of privileged elite elements sort of took over the leadership of it, as you would imagine they would try and do. Um, but he does make this point that, like, contrary to what he suggests, you might have to tell me whether this is your understanding, like, mm. con contrary to the narrative that's usually painted, painted about these revolution, the revolutionary forces fight, not revolution, uh, yeah, the revolutionary war forces fighting for independence in the war of independence, um, there were far more uh, laborers of the type we've discussed fighting than is usually given credit. And normally mm. what people fixate on is the sort of, like, the American farmer. Yeah, absolutely. When really it was mostly sort of like these wage laborers and these artisan um, sort of skilled laborers who were doing the fighting. And then, yes, as you say, like um, 
the the privileged classes of America, even when they were nominally committed to this revolutionary process, still couldn't help but try and make the swiftest book they could by sort of like ramping up <laughs> prices, um, sort of like charging extortionate rates even for food or what have you. But then also like, as you say, the sort of necessities of the, everything that you would need to fight a, a, a war successfully. Mm. Um, God, I hope people still aren't profiting off of war. I know, right? Bad. You would have thought. You, I mean, like, well, clearly, like, America was founded with this experience. <laughs> yeah. And um, so many uh, bills were passed at this time that were designed to control prices of mm. sort of, like, staple goods and sort of prevent this kind of uh, rabid profiteering. Mm. Um so, I mean, you have a great constitution, right? And it was sort of founded at this time of sort of great liberty oh and God. equality and freedom amongst uh, men. Uh, like, uh, cl- how, how could it have... I mean, it, it clearly, presumably, it carried on the same, right? Oh, right. sure. Things <laughs> yeah. are great. Yeah, yeah. Things are great. <laughs> okay. As we've said, Phew. it ends okay. here. All right. <laughs> We're, labor history in America ends with the Revolutionary yeah. War because we got yeah, everything yeah. we wanted. Yeah, yeah. One thing- not, uh, yeah, like, uh, the, one, the one thing that did kind of worry me... Well, it didn't worry me necessarily, <laughs> but he... I mean, he says some like he says some really interesting things that basically the Revolutionary War basically just did for, but like ended this kind of um, indentured yeah. workforce. Like that sort of model of uh, labor disappeared with this activity. Um, but it also he sort of seems to argue that it was the Revolutionary War that sort of set in train the abolition of slavery at the yeah. same time. Yeah, which isn't like which it, clearly he's making a nuanced point about. It. He's not saying that like this is this is a different moment kind of thing. But like yeah. I did also feel like. It's quite a lot more still had to happen. Yeah. <laughs> just, oh, just just because like Rhode Island decided not to have <laughs> slaves anymore because they never used slaves anyway. <laughs> Rhode Island at this time period, I'm not gonna make any judgment. Was there anybody there at all? <laughs> the worst colony slash state. It was it sucked. It was just the worst. S is that the bottom? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, but you're yeah, you're absolutely right to bring up the role that it played at least in ab- abolishing indentured servitude. And the reason for that was not a moral one. Again, obviously, it was one where uh, they needed more people to fight. So the government would, at least at the beginning, Initially buy up pay, their yeah. contracts because they'd be like, OK, we'll just pay your owner yeah. for your contract. Yeah. But then the treasurer of like <laughs> the army was like, guys, if we keep doing this, we're going to go bankrupt. We're going to spend all our money. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> buying out these contracts. Yeah. So then the Continental Congress as moral as they were, God mm. bless them, was like, we shall put an end to indentured servitude. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, all right, <laughs> great. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> and it's funny, he makes the point of saying that basically both sides were doing the same kind of thing with slaves, right? Like, yeah. you can have the freedom if you fight for us kind of thing. And the British yeah. were much better at this initially. And Absolutely, then sort of yeah. like the, uh, the nascent Americans sort of uh, yeah. got on board as well. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, American history is all good. I I do I do want to kind of want to know though about how you're taught about. Obviously, in America, we're not taught about like the labor practices and like the labor history of yeah. this specific time period, if at all, ever for any time period. But I'm interested to know kind of like how you're taught about um, the Revolutionary War here. If you are, like, is it just something that obviously it's not as important to your country's history as it's the United States? Sure. But is it just something of like? You acknowledge the the school system acknowledges the like importance of this quote unquote enlightened revolution. I feel like revolution. The, the British school system doesn't give you a very comprehensive overview of history. Mm. It doesn't cover all <laughs> events. No way. And it doesn't. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder why that is. And it doesn't. Um, and also, I don't really feel like it furnishes you with a very good sort of like narrative with which to understand history, even if you're not taught mm. about the specific events. Like early early history. I mean, all the way up until, uh, I don't know, really know what the American grading system is like, but all the way up until age like 13 or 14, I feel like all you get is various iterations of First World War, Second World War. Mm-hmm. They, they love the Blitz. Yeah. I, I mean, in primary school, we I, we had like, I remember they had their sort of, they did the Blitz quite a lot and had a sort of like a display in the in the assembly hall with various sort of like articles like gas masks and an air raid siren and stuff. So there's a big fixation on the Blitz Mm. um, because it was like a Britain's great moment (laughs) of triumph. (laughs) Yeah. Like the, the, the great example of what the British spirit is and Mm. the thing that we are all taught that we have to look back to, Mm. to, to 
to work out how our present age is lacking because mm. we clearly don't have the same blitz. I mean, it's grammar. It's just fucking it's stupid. Grim. Jesus Christ. Stupid uh, <laughs> outlook on history. And it, and like, it does a really horrible disservice to the <laughs> horror of the blitz. Right? Sure, like, yeah, no kidding. And how those people actually suffered kind of thing. Um, almost makes it sound like they should have been enjoying themselves. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> how privileged they were to be in the, in the, uh, the great the, i mean you i mean i guess you you talk about the um in america you talk about the the wartime generations as like the, the, great, the greatest the great the greatest generation the greatest <laughs> indeed uh, so it's not just the brits yeah um and then you do get some sort of like, you get like henry the eighth because sure. you're of henry the eighth yeah um so you get a very potted history yeah victoria a bit and victorian england there's a lot of social history involved Mm-hmm. And then when you get to the higher levels of, and when, when I did it, when you get to higher levels of history education, you get um, the 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 examination. The curriculum is based around certain exam boards, and um, those exam boards sort of like write exams based on specific. You you learn in detail specific periods of history. Yeah. So my only education in America in sort of formal history education was with they did the American West. Is what oh, we okay. did. Um, so yeah, I this don't is like know. the person. So it was always so it was all like it was a bit sort of cowboys and, and yeah, and, and what else? Yeah, yeah. I don't even. Oh my know. God, <laughs> it is it is just like the person designing the curriculum was just like I saw a movie about cowboys last yeah. night. I saw a movie about Henry VIII the last yeah. night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, GCSE education. I did um, the American West and the history of medicine. <laughs> okay. Separate topics. Sure, and then. A level history. I did the sort of Tudor, uh, the fifty sixteenth century Tudor England, and um, an interesting period of history: uh, Germany and Russia between like the eighteen seventies and the uh, nineteen fourteen. Interesting. Yeah, and actually, we, I think we went on into Stalinism and oh wow, some other bit. I guess yeah. that's beginning Florence Nightingale, proud the, Brit. Yeah. <laughs> God bless. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of that as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh so, yeah, I did. So I can't. So yeah, we're not really taught about it. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry about it. Nothing happened. We I don't quite know. If they were to teach it, how would they teach it? Learn I about mean, we probably get we probably get a very similar liberal argument that you would get in America. Yeah. Probably, you, you'd probably get uh, a triumph of liberty over tyranny. Exactly. Probably. We get the like, we inspired the French. And you get the, <laughs> we inspired the French with the Civil War. <laughs> if we can take anything from the education system, it's that the French have come up with nothing. <laughs> hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it is, it is so, so mind boggling that like any education system wants to just purge any kind of labor movement from the history books they're willing to just go to like insane uh obvi- i mean that's not a hot take at all but it's just like labor had nothing to do with this and if it did it was just like when you learn about the sons of liberty which you definitely do and sam adams and all those guys in school it's very much just like the lads sitting at a pub and they had a talk <laughs> and they were like boys this britain thing's gotta go <laughs> yeah it's interesting isn't it how Social history doesn't usually contain a lot of class analysis, or at least like it talks of class in a different way. It doesn't speak of class as collective agents kind of thing. Classes are, particularly working and impoverished classes, are people who suffer under a system and you sort of get introduced to the idea of how that people lived. Um, But there's no amount of how that, how the way that they lived influenced the way that they engaged with the world and attempted to change it. Yeah, it's funny. The one time you do learn about class in American schools, is, like the robber baron era, is like maybe 1870 to like 1900, maybe. Uh-huh. You learn about J.P. Morgan, you learn about Jay Gould, you learn about like Carnegie, you learn about all these people. Is like America had its flirtation with robber barons and with okay. horrible they, labor they, practices. Is it, is it meant to be like it was bad, but also a degree of romance at the same time? Yeah. Like, as a kind of like we're going to fixate on these interesting characters because they're interesting characters, but we're also going to be like, we've moved beyond this form of capitalism. Definitely and so that. we've learned our lessons. Exactly. Kind of it's, thing. it's almost a way to be like, there's no such thing as capitalism. Yeah. It's the, we ended it then. Yeah. Yeah. It basically ended with the great depression and then exactly. Then we learned the error for our ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we just went from strength to strength. The new deal went on forever. But yeah, thank God. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, God. Um, McCarthy. McCarthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh God. Dallas who? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Was there was there anything else you wanted to bring up in this? I mean, I guess we should say that the role that, like, um, when we talk about the wage laborers and leading up to the Revolutionary War, we should also mention that, like, massive disenfranchisement also played a pretty big role, obviously, yeah. in them being like, hey, can we vote? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that there was, like, some statistic that Fawner did that, like, in the cities of Pennsylvania, that, like, only 5% of people could vote <laughs> at a certain point, like, leading up to yeah, the war. Yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah, that's one way to make people want to, you know. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things that... Um... One of the elements of the class struggle that preceded the onset of the American Revolution was this dem- was this demand for greater democracy. Yeah. Um, and how the sort of organized forces of the various classes sort of pitted themselves against each other in this effort to gain greater... Well, they were both vying for control over these sort of nascent American democratic institutions, um, sort of trying to control the election of representatives that went to the continental congresses that yeah. sat in the various state congresses kind of thing um and it was in, in a lot of ways it, it seems to be the case that it was these democratic demands of the working class that created some of the better elements of the eventually the american constitution but the constitution of the various states as well in terms of their ostensible commitment to like what we would now call like liberal bourgeois yeah. liberal norms kind of thing but like yeah freedom of speech and freedom of religion in a sense that kind of thing. yeah the bill of rights yeah um uh, but it's yeah it's a, it's a direct it's, it comes directly out of a um struggle for democracy for greater representation from these working classes and i guess i guess the con the converse idea of that would be like it's just something that popped into the head of um Thomas Jefferson when he was writing the Declaration of Independence kind of thing like I mean you could almost see it represented like that like the Declaration of Independence was the result of some sort of flowery rhetorical use of language that was purely the creation of it was Thomas Jefferson that wrote the Declaration of Independence I'm not wrong Um, I hope (laughs) uh, it was it was in the air it's the great and it was in the air because it was a fundamental part of the class struggle that was happening at the time exactly um same with whatever like actually Thomas Paine seems like an interesting character and in that he mm. seems to have come from this class right like mm. um I don't know yeah P- punk punk ass though all these guys punk ass I like to think that Ben uh Benjamin um Shapiro <laughs> <laughs> sorry yes Benjamin it. Shapiro is not one of these people um uh I don't Just know punk 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 ass all these people were punk ass I will say what's I think- he called the guy who um Sorry, <laughs> the guy who uh, was um, integral to the the spying on the British for the Americans and head head of the intelligence thing, Paul Revere. Paul Revere. I'd like to know yeah. more about Paul Revere. Is he, I is he like a is, it, is he a, is he a bad guy? I don't guy care in for Paul Revere. Oh, okay. I don't care for Paul Revere just because I I maybe I've just heard the goddamn story about the lamps so many times. Just, <laughs> I don't care at all. I, I mean that all. is in here. Yeah, the, yeah, la- the exactly. lamps were lit, and then Paul Revere rode. <laughs> yeah. I like do think, signal, but... yeah, I do think it's pretty cool whenever anybody talks about the quarter, the quartering act or whatever it was called about how it was like, uh, everybody in like Boston as being like, can't stay here. You can't stay in my town when like the soldiers, the British soldiers needed somewhere to stay. Uh-huh. And they'd be like, can we please stay with you? And they'd be like, no, sorry, we have no room. <laughs> but they're from Boston. So probably be like, no, get out of here. <laughs> Go socks. <laughs> I think that's cool. Shout out to those people. I'll be honest. Pretty cool. <laughs> um, it is interesting though, right? Because like, Say we're talking to a perspective, uh, someone to convince of their class. Uh, I can't, God, I just can't think of the basic words today. Their class. Interest. Interest. Thank you, Dan. Um, who isn't a commie, who isn't left, who doesn't give a shit about politics as any sane person would. Um, you, can't, you can't just go up to them and be like, the American Revolution and the founding of the country is all based on class struggle because they're gonna they're gonna be like, what are you talking about? They're gonna mm-hmm. that's gonna either sound too dogmatic or they're just gonna be like, well, what are you talking? I don't even know what you're talking about. And I think Fawner does a really we can hassle him a bit, but I think he does a really good job of balancing the like, 
you can have your Samuel Adamses and your heroes, and you can have all of these if you people. Must. If you must, you you knuckle dragging <laughs> mouth breathers. Um, but I think he does Keep a pr- Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, well, <laughs> but he does a good job of balancing the. No, like, we don't want it. We don't want him. I mean, we, don't we don't want, want any, any of these characters. People. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll take Sam Adams. Why not? Um, he seems like a good guy. Well, maybe not a good guy. He sounds fun. Um, he does a good job of balancing the like. He made the beer, right? Yeah, so sure. Why not? <laughs> Of, Sam Adams being, <laughs> of balancing the like American uh, uh, narrative and the American like uh, what the revolution was supposed to be with this idea of class struggle. And I think it, he, the narrative that he spins is one that you could easily um, spread to kind of like sow the seeds of um, a basic class identity in somebody. Because you're, you know, he's able to basically keep all of these actors, these historical actors, and keep, which is, I think, really important, which I think a lot of leftists don't do, keep the idea of like the American Revolution as something that was based in class struggle and something that was based in popular, I should say, maybe not class struggle. Some This narrative of like the American Revolution as something that's based in some kind of populist struggle for democracy yeah because yeah. He, he's able to basically say you know that is what it was supposed to be yeah. and it's able it, I think it's really able to come across as very like easily digestible to the average american sure. as opposed just, to just like a basic like class struggle like you, kind you, of there thing. is a great potentiality for you to lose some of the romance of this mm. and you can maintain it because like these values were f- fundamentally important to uh, a suffering class of person kind of thing for whom this was the possibility for their liberation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think it's it's easily digestible, I suppose is my point, as opposed to just the basic, like... Uh it's funny, right? Because I don't, I don't really know what audience he was writing for. Because it seems it's fairly academic in the sense that it's very well researched and stuff. And like, you're not just going to be some person at an airport and pick up a book called "History of the Labor Movement: in The United States, Volume One of Like Five Thousand. But <laughs> read Volume Two on the flight back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have an extremely long flight. But like, it is. Yeah, it's it's a good book. It, read it, everybody, because it's very easy. Yeah, I've been read. enjoying it, and I was looking through the other chapters, and there mm. seemed to be some more, some that I'd really like to look at. It's almost too in depth. It's like okay, yeah, yeah, the mechanics, yeah. I, like, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next chapter is like American economic history from 1780 yeah. to 1880, and I was like, oh, okay, we're jumping through some time here. And then you go, the last chapter is actually like <laughs> economic developments from 80 to 81, yeah, and exactly. all the other chapters in between are just various little elements of like, yeah, here's on the unions, and here's. I'd like to read the chapter on like the the utopian movement. Yeah, that would be yeah, quite yeah. interesting. I'm suggested that one. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd also like to learn more about the. The the immigration of veterans of the eighteen forty eight revolution mm. and the significance that they made to mm. uh, the civil war absolutely and yeah. sort of the, the, for, the formation I don't know that I don't know whether well the republic they they were all joined the republican party I think mm. but the the contribution they made to the republican party and to those those politics kind of thing absolutely yeah. would be quite interesting thing to look and at. just as generals because like nobody in America knew how to fight a war uh-huh. so a lot of the Germans specifically came over and were like oh this is what you do uh, <laughs> I did not know that that's fascinating yeah. it is really interesting. there's one guy he's not a German he's an American absolutely fascinating guy kind of a bad dude but also kind of a good dude in some ways uh, John C Fremont um, I'll go I'll, okay I'll just say bad guy. Um, he was an explorer pretty early on, um, pretty vital in mapping out everything west of the Rockies for the United States. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it had already been mapped out by like Mexico because it was Mexico. But uh, he took three uh, really interesting um, voyages from like St. Louis to California, where he. It later became apparent in the historical record was just spying and sussing out the possibility for a revolt against Mexico, one that he wound up. Uh, putting underway in Northern California. But he eventually then, after all of that, after the Mexican-American War, wound up becoming a general, I think, in the um, uh, Civil War for the Union and was one of the most radical Republicans and almost got the Republican nomination or did get the Republican nomination and lost. Um, But yeah, abolitionist, interesting guy. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot to do with the uh, 48ers, I believe. Yeah. So yeah. That's something that's just occurred to me that maybe we could finish on or consider talking about Ah. briefly. Um, which is what the, I mean, this might be quite well known, actually, but what the uh, the revolution did for the development of these classes, I suppose. Sure. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I got the sense or I'm led to believe that the British very deliberately curtailed or prevented any potential geographic expansion of the states. They mm. wanted those colonies oh, sure. to stay where they were. They wanted them to be 
extractive and connected directly to the sort of like British Empire and British trade routes and didn't want presumably didn't want them to expand westwards yeah. the because they would it, it would herald developing an internal economy of their own they'd need to have internal trade and really they just mm-hmm. wanted exclusively trade with Britain mm-hmm. um, and so the civil the civil war not civil war the revolutionary war um opened up the West, well, opened up the space for westward expansion, which were, then led, meant that there was so much more land for this development of the sort of like the yeoman farmer, which sort of becomes a potential, I suppose, what I understand to be quite a significant character in the development mm. of American sure. life, I suppose. So a lot of these people could then go on to be, go on to get land in the West and sort of like mm. become farmers or contribute to that westward expansion kind of thing. So, Absolutely. Um, that's kind of the next step in the story. And it's because of the, the, the Revolutionary War had this fundamental change in the sort of like yeah. class dynamics, I yeah. suppose. No, what, absolutely. What, how those classes went on to develop, kind of thing. And yeah, and and not just for the for the farmers and the yeomen, but also for the wage laborers in the cities. Mike Davis makes a point. I think it's in Prisoners of the American Dream, where he talks about how whenever there were. He makes the point of like, you know, he asks the question of like, why were the cities in what is now like Ohio and, you know, Western Pennsylvania and uh, uh, in that part of the town, like the Midwest, why did they have more progressive um, labor policies at certain points in history? And he says that it's because whenever things got too bad, because like Boston and New York and all of these East Coast towns were um, industrialized to the point of exploitation that was like unbearable for a lot of the workers they would just get up and move west yeah and so they would go to like cities in ohio and like pittsburgh and places like yeah. that and, and they become more i suppose that sort of a, 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 um uh expansionist tendency then created this sort of class of itinerant worker which yeah becomes quite central to the idea of the american working class i mean i don't know how much they overlap actually because i think of the itinerant worker as being an early 20th century sort of IWW person who yeah. works different trade. That's more of a seasonal type of work kind of thing, mm. rather than whereas the expansion is happening in the end of the nineteenth century. But still, like I don't know whether those two correlate or contribute mm. one to the other. I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, no, definitely. And then I mean, it kind of all culminates, at least in certain parts of the country, in the Dust Bowl because that migration has gotten too intense and the farming practices have gotten too uh, bad uh-huh. that then that whole part of the country gets ruined the soil folks the soil soil. it's all the soil Soil. mono fucking monoculture and then they all come to california goddamn okies (laughs) (laughs) they drink it dry drink it dry yeah um set it on fire on their way out yeah exactly and then um start just an absolutely great state in its midst um yeah that sets up one of the better countries in uh history yeah uh, (laughs) Nothing to do with labor exploitation and class struggle. <laughs> and it was just great men yeah. like yeah, Paul yeah, Revere yeah. and George Washington yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. all the other good people. Dudes being dudes. About. Just do, it was dudes being dudes. <laughs> it's definitely dudes being dudes. Um, yeah, good stuff. Good, good, good stuff. And it all it all stems Dan from these from these presumably allegedly pedophilic people involved in the English Civil War. Uh, uh, guys like maybe Putnam, no, not Putnam. Uh, I don't know. A bunch of guys who were involved on the Republican side or the parliamentary side of the English Civil War were the like Virginia Company guys as well. Oh right, okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So look at that—a little bit of a through line between the Ellen Meeks and Wood right uh-huh. up to now. Uh-huh. We're filling uh-huh. in. We're filling in the filling blanks in of the history. Blanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> we're yeah. getting there. Yeah. Um, huh. I took it out of me. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh-huh. America. It's a good folks. read. It's a good read. It's a good read. I'm pleased. Yeah. Yeah, good. Good to reshape the uh, general idea of uh, early American history is not just one of mass genocide and slaughter, but also of wage exploitation, <laughs> yes. yeah, labor yeah. exploitation. Mm. Um, we'll get to the New Deal eventually. Yeah, <laughs> what was the New Deal? I'm beginning to think that it was never a thing. Honestly, <laughs> just the phantom of American just, history. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We built some dams. I don't know. That's all we did. <laughs> And they've all turned out great. <laughs> they've all, oh my God, don't get me started on the dams. <laughs> Jack, Jack has, Jack's been out of shape about the dams. I've been all out of shape about these goddamn dams. <laughs> um, there are a couple uh, where I'm from that, it's, they're, that were pointless when they were made and they're pointless now. When were they built? Uh, are they, the one these, in my are these town, New Deal projects or were they later in the 70s? They, I, think, I think, yeah, I think the one in my town actually was a uh, New Deal project. I believe it was probably 30s, maybe 40s. Um, 
there was one that was near me that definitely was. I'm not sure about the one I'm thinking of, but yeah, it's just all. There was a period of American history, Dan, where they just decided to dam every single river in the country. And it just, not only did they <laughs> fill up with silt because they the just, <laughs> yeah, literally, because none of them were like hydroelectric dams except for like Hoover Dam, uh-huh. which, okay, great. Yeah, that's fine. But like, they'll just ruin everything. That? Yeah, oh God. <laughs> Every day, I'm pretty freaky, folks. I don't know. Don't go there if you're afraid of heights. I'll tell you that from experience. Um, all right. American history. <laughs> it's bad. What's the word for a phobia of dams? Jack has it. <laughs> damn phobia. Da- <laughs> <laughs> My God, damn, damn phobia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. We okay. should read something about some dams. All right. Or not. I'll get too angry. <laughs> uh, it's the steelhead trout, Dan, that can't swim upstream. Um, poor trout. Poor trout. Yeah. Wow. Well, are you anti trout? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. Um, I have a phobia of trout. God. What are, what are you? What is your. Do you have a phobia? What's your phobia? Um, I think this is a weird one. And I, I think it exists. <laughs> okay. And I think, I think there is a word for it. Someone right. can tell me. I have a, like, I have a, I have a, I don't, I've not experienced it in quite a long time. I don't mm. know what it's a phobia. I have a sort of like gut revulsion at um things with irregular small holes in like <laughs> right. mo- like mottled or like damaged surfaces interesting um i think that's called trypophobia or sometimes something like it that. comes from like sp- sometimes sponges a little bit but like mm. yeah i've not experienced it in a long time so maybe it's gone away mm. i've heard um, of this yeah okay trip tryptophobia or tryptophobia oh, it's actually a thing, it is oh, a thing. Right. Yeah. yeah yeah i yeah. thought it was yeah. i've sometimes I've, I've sometimes speculated whether it might be like um whether it's i mean i don't know whether it's possible no it seems I'm, i've sometimes wondered what i mean i don't really think that i don't know whether i believe in like um i suppose it would be like a a genetic or like a, a oh sure I, I, I sometimes wondered whether that kind of thing is a real... I say, use the word mottled, but like it's sort of reminiscent of like damaged mottled skin, which might mm. be a, connected to like disease. So it Leprosy. might be a revulsion. It might be a learn. Mm. But it seems unlikely that I don't really believe in like... <laughs> so, tell, someone, someone, tell, someone tell me whether like genetic knowledge is a thing. I think you just had a... You had an unfortunate incident with a leper when you were a yeah. young child. <laughs> Someone's yeah, nose fell off. It's grim up love. There's a lot of lepers in Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame um yeah i don't know just for me heights i'd say oh my they were uh they did this thing in a yankees game where it was like put up on the big screen it was like you know get to know the players and they like asked three players like what's your favorite color you know where are you from blah blah blah, blah. and one of the questions was um what are you most afraid of and two of the players said like clowns and the other one said like heights or something and then <laughs> the third one who's like the most famous player on the team aaron judge said uh, loneliness. And it was just like, oh my God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It was like, I don't think we wanted to get that real. <laughs> well, that was awesome. Someone always takes it too far. Yes. Yeah, it? Like the guy writing it down was like, okay. <laughs> Do you oh, need help? Cut this segment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think we're done, aren't we? I think we're done. Yeah. yeah. Let's just call it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that was Philip Foner, the first few chapters of the first volume of History of the Labor <laughs> Movement in the United States from Colonial Times to the Founding of the American Federation. Just like of Labor. all the other books we've started and not finished. <laughs> Well, maybe we'll be back to it. Maybe we'll be back to it. And I like that we do this, though, because then we can't. Um, uh, uh, like endorse this book in any way because he <laughs> might have crazy stuff at the end but yeah. from what we read yeah. it's pretty good yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. might end with like assassination plots and everything yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the Dulles Imperium <laughs> alright let's end it before we start talking about the Dulles again um, I've been Jack this has been Exodic Statements thank you so much for listening I've been Jack thanks for listening guys. see you next time bye bye The music you heard this episode was Music to Kill Bad People To by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. If you like this song, you can check it out and much, much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. Be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more comedy discussion. Till next time. Whoa.